Hi, my name is Sue Hopewell. I'm a tissue viability nurse at Tally. The following video will feature information contained in two pocket guides on pressure ulcer classification and pressure ulcers in people with dark skin tones. So if we start with the definition of a pressure ulcer, pressure ulcers can be defined as localised damage to the skin and or underlying tissue as a result of pressure or pressure in combination with shear. Pressure ulcers usually occur over a bony prominence but may also be related to a medical device or other object. Pressure ulcers are categorised by their severity and may be limited to the superficial tissue, tissues of the epidermis and dermis or extend to deeper tissue exposing and or involving muscle, tendon and bone. To allow for continuity of care, a reliable tool is important when communicating the status of a pressure ulcer. Therefore, a recognised pressure ulcer classification system is essential. Um, and this allows us uh, to correctly identify and classify pressure related tissue damage. The EPUAP and NPUAP pressure ulcer classification system is utilised internationally and consists of six categories. I will go through each of these categories in turn. So firstly, category or stage one pressure ulcer. This is non-blanchable erythema. So this is intact skin with non-blanchable redness of a localised area, usually over a bony prominence. Darkly pigmented skin may not have visible blanching and its colour may differ from the surrounding area. The area may be painful, firm, soft, warmer or cooler as compared to adjacent tissue. And category 1 pressure ulcers may be difficult to detect in individuals with dark skin tones. And I will go on to talk about um, identifying pressure damage in people with dark skin tones later in the video. And category 1 pressure ulcers may indicate at-risk individuals, so a heralding sign of risk. And moving on to category 2 pressure ulcers, this is partial thickness skin loss. So we have partial thickness loss of the dermis, presenting as a shallow open ulcer with a red-pink wound bed, without slough. It may also present as an intact or open ruptured, uh, or ruptured serum-filled blister. And it could also present as a shiny or dry shallow ulcer without slough or bruising. If there is bruising present, this may indicate suspected deep tissue injury. And this category should not be used to describe skin tears, tape burns, perineal dermatitis, maceration or excoriation. Moving on to category 3 pressure ulcers, this is full thickness tissue loss and subcutaneous fat may be visible but bone, tendon or muscle are not exposed. Slough may be present but does not uh, obscure the depth of tissue loss and it may or they may also include undermining and tunnelling. The depth of a category 3 pressure ulcer varies by anatomical location. So for example the bridge of the nose, the ear, the occiput and malleolus do not have subcutaneous tissue and category 3 ulcers can be shallow in these areas. In contrast, areas of significant adiposity can develop ex extremely deep category 3 pressure ulcers. However, with category 3 pressure ulcers, bone tendon um, is not visible or directly palpable. And then category 4 pressure ulcers, this is full thickness tissue loss with exposed bone, tendon or muscle. Slough or eschar may be present on some parts of the wound bed and often these ulcers often include undermining and tunnelling. Again, the depth of the category 4 pressure ulcer can vary by anatomical location. So I've mentioned previously, those areas that do not have subcutaneous tissue, um, you know, in these areas the ulcers can um, uh, present um, quite shallow. Category 4 ulcers can extend into muscle and or supporting structures, for example the fascia, tendon or joint capsule, making osteomyelitis possible. Exposed bone and tendon is visible or directly palpable. And then we have unstageable, where the depth is unknown. So this is full thickness tissue loss in which the base of the ulcer is covered by slough, 
and or eschar in the womb bed. And until enough slough or eschar and or eschar is removed to expose the base of the wound, the true depth and therefore the category cannot be determined. If there is stable eschar on the heels, this serves as the body's natural biological cover and should not be removed. And then lastly, suspected deep tissue injury. Again, this is where depth is unknown and presents as a purple or maroon localised area of discoloured intact skin or blood filled blister due to damage of underlying soft tissue from pressure and or shear. The area may be preceded by tissue that is painful, firm, mushy, boggy, warmer or cooler as compared to adjacent tissue. And deep tissue injury may be difficult to detect in individuals with dark skin tones and evolution may include a thin blister over a dark wound bed. The wound may further evolve and become covered by thin eschar and evolution may be rapid exposing additional layers of tissue even with optimal treatment in place. And from looking through each of these categories, it is clear that early detection of pressure related skin damage is vital as it allows for appropriate intervention, which can prevent progression to more severe injuries. Therefore, the ability to accurately identify and confirm a category one pressure ulcer in all skin types is of significant importance. Healthcare professionals and carers are typically taught to look for redness or erythema as a first sign of pressure damage. And whilst this is relatively simple to identify in Caucasian skin, it can prove to be difficult to diagnose accurately when assessing individuals with darker skin tones. To, re to reduce the risk of erythema um, and category one pressure ulcers developing into full thickness wounds in patients with dark skin tones, it is essential for clinical staff and carers to recognise the other signs and symptoms that can be observed on the skin as and obviously as early indicators of pressure related tissue damage. And these include purplish or bluish discoloration, a purple hue where ischemia is present, localised edema or swelling due to that inflammatory response, temperature changes, uh, you can have initial warmth due to that inflammatory response which will become cooler as tissue death occurs and also pain and discomfort and any alteration in sensation in response to and that, again that will be in response to either inflammation or ischemia and also it's important to look for changes in tissue consistency in relation to the surrounding skin for example induration so hardness due to it uh, again that would be due to excessive inflammation and necrosis um, but the skin may also become soft and boggy whilst these additional signs and symptoms are applicable to all skin tones they can be particularly useful when caring for patients with dark skin tones when obvious pressure related redness on the skin can be more difficult to identify so if we look at some considerations for clinical practice, um, skin should be carefully inspected for any discoloration over pressure areas. And areas of discoloration in relation to surrounding skin should be assessed more closely for temperature changes, edema, changes in tissue consistency and pain. It's also important to note that this is a guide only and signs and symptoms of pressure ulcers may present differently on different skin tones. And lastly, education is a critical factor in ensuring that all members of the clinical team can strive to prevent and treat pressure ulcers according to the best evidence available. If you would like a copy of the pressure ulcer classification guides, please visit our website, which is shown here on the screen. Thank you for listening. I hope you found this video useful.